Okay, everyone. Well, I think we're good to go. So uh, welcome to uh, this uh, Hutchings uh, webinar. Uh, today, we are looking at uh, maximising the sale price of your pharmacy in Scotland. Uh, we've got some uh, great and expert speakers with us today. Um, Kicking off will be Paul Steet, uh, Associate Director of Hutchings Consultants. Uh, Paul will provide an insight on the, on, on the key areas that can increase the value of your pharmacy. And he'll also explain the process of uh, marketing your business for sale and the different options that are available uh, um, you know, to, to, to secure you the best terms uh, for, your, for your pharmacy, as well as, you know, Something that's important, obviously, is, is value, but you also want to make sure that the terms are right for you. And, and Paul's going to go through that. Um, Artif Butt, a senior accountant at Hutchings Accountants. Artif will uh, discuss the accounting aspects, obviously, uh, relating to pharmacy sales. Uh, he will also be highlighting how to reduce your tax liabilities. Uh, so you'll, you walk away with more money in your pocket, uh, which uh, is definitely something I like, Artif. So I'll be listening. Um, and uh, Nick Howie, a partner at Anderson Strathern. Uh, Nick will advise on all legal aspects of selling your pharmacy. Uh, he will also provide uh, tips on how to avoid some of the unnecessary pitfalls uh, that can delay a sale. And that's really, really key here because, um, you know, uh, the legal aspects from a non-legal perspective eventually uh, will, will, you know, uh, take care of themselves. And I'm, I'm sure Nick doesn't feel like they take care of themselves. Uh, <laughs> but being able to be prepared and uh, make sure that, you know, you're maybe um, completing one piece of, of admin or preparing one document first could save you, you know, one, two, three months, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in turning things around, uh, you know, when, when the sale comes to close. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, three, three really bits of uh, great, great content here tonight. And uh, kicking it off, as I said, is Paul. So Paul, if you're um, okay to go ahead, I'm going to hand things over to you. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the introduction there. Let me just, uh, Bring up my presentation for you. I'm just going to stay on the line, Paul, to make sure that everything's all right, and then I'll um, I'll jump off. Thank you. Okay. So is that coming through okay, Sam? Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. Okay. So, hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for for joining us. Uh, the three presentations this evening that uh, you're you're listening to will explain the process involved in setting your pharmacy business from valuation through to completion. The knowledge and advice we are sharing with you has the overall theme of seeking to minimise your stress during the sale and maximising the price you eventually walk away with. All three companies have years of knowledge and experience in Scottish pharmacy sales and understand how a pharmacy transaction should work. For those of you who have not sold through Hutchins Consultants before, I just wanted to briefly explain that we are the largest independent pharmacy only agent in the UK. Our typical sales will range from single pharmacies with a turnover of around £300,000 up to small groups of around £100 million turnover. We've been approved and recommended by the NPA to its members for the selling and buying of pharmacy businesses since 2005 and are currently the only NPA supplier to reach platinum status. We have an excellent reputation in the sector. And there is no potential conflict of interest which could either create an issue or jeopardise a sale with Hutchins Consultants. For example, we don't receive any referral or commission fees when introducing buyers to finance brokers or solicitors. Overall, we have a wealth of knowledge and experience in selling pharmacy businesses, and this enables us to provide you with an insight on current factors affecting the market. Before I move on to explaining the process of valuing and selling your pharmacy business, I would like to briefly share with you what effect we have seen as a result of the pandemic and run through some key business performance indicators. Despite the wide ranging challenges thrown up due to COVID-19 over the last few years, the market has remained very buoyant in Scotland. Pharmacy has been viewed by many buyers as a relatively safe haven when compared to other more volatile sectors. New buyer registrations across the UK rose significantly in 2020 and almost double when compared to earlier years, although 2021 and 2022 registrations have seen a return to more steady levels. We've been approached by potential buyers from outside of pharmacy keen to invest, although the vast majority of completed deals have been agreed to buyers already operating in the sector. The number of pharmacies coming onto the market fell in 2020 and early 2021, as many owners were either too busy dealing with the fallout from COVID 
Well, they may have wanted to understandably take advantage of the increased income generated. However, this changed in the latter half of last year as many owners finally found some breathing space to contemplate a sale. The major banks who traditionally lend to the pharmacy sector have remained supportive, although they have tightened their lending criteria and are heavily scrutinising lending applications from buyers. I'll now move on, on, sorry, I'll now move on to run through some of the key performance indicators of most interest to buyers and sellers. You will see over the next few slides that in order to provide a benchmark comparison, I've included average figures for Scotland, England and Wales. As a guide, pence and pound figures provide a broad overview of prices that are being achieved and demonstrates how much is paid for each pound of turnover the business is generating. You will see from this slide that average pence and pound figures in Scotland are vastly outperforming those seen elsewhere in the UK. In comparison to England, for example, Buyers' confidence has been buoyed by the perceived greater support from the Scottish Government for the pharmacy sector, and this has helped support goodwill prices. The low availability of pharmacies for sale in Scotland compared to the high level of buyer demand has helped sustain goodwill prices unseen elsewhere in recent years. I must stress the point that these figures show an average price only. Every pharmacy business sale is individual, and there will be sales that achieve a price below these figures and others that far exceed it. For example, pharmacies located within the central belt should expect to achieve a, a higher sale price on average than those situated in other more remote parts of the country. This next slide shows the average number of offers received per sale. Due to the current high buyer demand in Scotland, you might expect to see a higher average number of offers per sale compared to that seen in England. However, the market south of the border in England generally provides more opportunities for first-time buyers, which, as a result, boosts the number of offers received on each sale. This next graph shows the average multiple of EBITDA, also known as the adjusted net profit, achieved on sales that have completed since the start of 2022. Again, as you can see, Scotland is vastly outperforming the rest of the UK by a significant margin. An important key performance indicator of mutual interest to sellers and buyers alike is the gross profit percentage margin the business is trading at. As this slide demonstrates, Scottish contractors are achieving higher margins than their counterparts elsewhere. High margins ultimately increase the saleability and value of a pharmacy business, and any potential sellers are advised to pay close attention to the buying aspects of their operation wherever possible. So, which group of buyers are the most active in the marketplace right now? When well, the majority of sales continue to involve buyers already working or operating in the sector. At the start of the pandemic, we had an uplift investors from outside of pharmacy registering, although this has now subsided. Group owners and smaller existing operators are the most active buyers in the current market. However, the corporates and multiples have started buying again, having trimmed poor performing branches from their portfolios. All categories of buyers are making offers, creating more competition between themselves, which as a seller, you ideally want to encourage. Crucially, increased competition between buyers can strengthen the seller's negotiating position when offers are called in. The vast majority of buyers for Scottish pharmacies are already located in the country, although we also receive interest from buyers based across the water in both Ireland and Northern Ireland. Owing to the lack of opportunity to acquire, many buyers have started to offer on opportunities over the border in Northern England. One such sale in North East England has recently completed. To demonstrate the buoyancy in the market, I wanted to quickly show you two examples of recent successful sales. I'm unable to divulge too much information for confidentiality reasons, but the first example is Calder Pharmacy in Edinburgh, which had a turnover in the region of 1.1 million and dispensed around 5,000 items per month. Following the period of marketing, we received four offers and accepted an offer from a first-time buyer at 10 times multiple of EBITDA.
This next example is Aitken Pharmacy based in East Lothian, which had a turnover around 1.85 million and dispensed around 10,000 items per month. We received six offers and accepted an offer from an existing owner at 14.9 times EBITDA. The average combined sale price for the two pharmacies equated to circa two pounds in the pound. As we look ahead to the remainder of this year and further into early 2023, it's very hard to predict the market and what will happen to goodwill values going forward with any certainty. At the current time, we are achieving excellent prices. And whilst we anticipate more pharmacies coming onto the market compared to last year, we're not predicting anything close to an oversupply. There are some headwinds in the economy right now and, and wider world, which uh, we'll, we will be aware of, um, which may have a knock-on effect on sale values, such as rising business and staffing costs, increasing bank interest rates and loan repayments, not to mention the wider geopolitical situation. The pharmacy contract in Scotland, with its shifting emphasis towards pharmacy first and greater service provision, follows similar strategies in Wales and England used to alleviate pressures elsewhere in the NHS and further highlights the important role for community pharmacy. However, there are also positive as the pandemic has created a newfound respect for the pharmacy sector at both a governmental level and in public minds. The usual ebb and flow of banks entering and exiting the health sector continues, but overall they remain keen to lend, enabling the market to keep moving. Despite many challenges, the sale market in Scotland is very buoyant right now, partly due to the small number of pharmacies entering the market. And if you are considering selling, I would urge you to contact Hutchins and speak to either myself or one of my colleagues. Once we have an understanding of your individual position, we can share our recommendations personal to you. So that concludes the brief overview of the current marketplace in Scotland. I'll now press ahead and explain the steps involved in taking your pharmacy business to market from valuation stage right through to completion. Before we can start the marketing, we need to establish a value for your business and recommend the marketing price. A competent agent will want to understand your business before they can advise you and will need to gather financial information from you to conduct the valuation. This is an example of the information we usually require. We don't wish to overburden you, but the more information we have at this stage, the more accurate we can be with the valuation. Ultimately, this will reduce the risk of disappointment for you when offers are called in. We review all the information supplied to us and produce an adjusted profit and loss. This establishes an EBITDA figure. We then calculate the value by adding a multiplier to this figure and at the same point, consider any other factors that can affect the value. There are many factors a competent agent needs to consider when valuing a business. This slide shows some of the main factors, but there are many more. Factors such as wholesale income and private scripts will have a defined monetary effect on value. Others, such as the level of competition in the area or business potential, are harder to define but still need to be considered. We're sometimes asked to value a business based on just the turnover or items, for example. We're usually reluctant to do this as it can lead to some misleading figures. To provide a credible valuation for you, a professional agent will always need to, uh, a certain amount of information from, from you to understand your business. Most sellers understandably want to achieve the best price they can when it comes to a sale. You've worked extremely hard over the years to maximize your business and make it a success. And it's important to feel rewarded for this when handing the reins over to a new buyer. As you've seen, there are a large number of factors that could affect the valuation. Many owners ask us which areas of the business they should focus on to increase its value. For most pharmacies, there are four key areas to concentrate on as they can impact the saleability and value of the business. Firstly, gross profit percentage margin. As previously mentioned, this is at the forefront of most buyers' minds when looking to buy a pharmacy. As you saw earlier, the average margin currently is around 36% in Scotland. 
a slight increase in margin can potentially add thousands of pounds to the business value. And many of our clients advise us they're devoting more time to the buying side of the business to secure the best prices wherever they, uh, they can. Working hard to improve your margin will be time wasted if you allow your business costs to run out of control. If you're planning to sell, it's so important to keep a tight rein on your costs. Both the buyer, their accountant and lender will scrutinise your P&L. Staff pay increases and ongoing bonuses, for example, will affect your bottom line, particularly if they're all above the industry norm. You'll no doubt be aware that some of the highest locum costs in the UK are in Scotland currently, which understandably for some contractors is creating financial pressures. Many costs will be outside of your immediate control, but I advise keeping a close eye on them nonetheless, particularly in the lead up to a sale. Item numbers. Even though the remuneration contract encourages the increase in provision of clinical services, item numbers still remain hugely important in the marketplace. As it currently stands, buyers are attracted to busy pharmacies with strong increasing item numbers, and it's not envisaged for this to change for the foreseeable future. I appreciate if you are planning to sell, this may not be an area you wish to focus on, but it will increase the saleability of your business when you eventually do come to sell. Finally, pharmacies operating on a lease basis should ideally have as long a lease as possible to, at the point of marketing. Banks usually match the term of the buyer's loan to the remaining term on the lease. So if you have a short lease of say less than 10 years, this may present an issue for a buyer obtaining the bank support they need. An experienced owner with a good relationship with their bank may find it less problematic. Nevertheless, the lease should be considered for renewal if less than 10 years, if possible. If you feel this could be an issue for you, do speak to us before approaching your landlord, as we should be able to guide you on the best strategy around this. So coming back to what's next in the process, we have the confidential meeting. This is an opportunity for the consultant to meet you and spend some time understanding your objectives and discussing any concerns you may have. The meeting normally takes place at the premises once the staff have left for the day. This allows us an opportunity to view the premises without alerting staff. Alternatively, if this isn't possible for any reason, we can conduct a mystery shop exercise that meets you off-site at a suitable venue. During the meeting, we discuss and agree the marketing strategy, and it's another opportunity to answer any queries you may have. The next step in the process is preparing the sales literature. Our sale brochure is designed to be eye-catching to potential buyers and covers the most salient points of the business, demonstrating profitability and potential. The key is also to provide sufficient information to buyers at an early stage in order to reduce the volume of questions they may ask. The marketing only commences once you've reviewed and signed off the final document and are happy to move forwards. A confidential listing may be added, if need be, to our website as this generates buyer inquiries. But owing to the high level of buyer demand in the market, this isn't usually required for most pharmacies currently. We also prepare a separate financials pack, which includes copies of the accounts, FP34s, VAT returns, OTC figures, and a copy of the lease if applicable. Before moving on, I wanted to talk a little bit about the different sales strategies we use to generate buyer interest. As I mentioned, we always discuss and agree with our client the most suitable strategy to use prior to the marketing beginning. The most common strategy adopted in Scotland is the more confidential off-market approach, but occasionally we will recommend to clients a full marketing approach is taken. Whichever approach we take, only potential buyers who have registered with us and signed our non-disclosure agreement are contacted. With the full marketing approach, an initial shortlist of buyers is created from our database of several thousand buyers. When researching the buyers, the consultants will look at who is active in the market and viewing or making offers, as well as who do we believe have the funds available. The consultants will also discuss the sale with other team members to seek their recommendations. 
Potential buyers then receive the memorandum of sale followed by the financials pack if they're interested. The buyers are followed up and viewings generated as a result. We keep the marketing under constant review and the buyers list can be quickly expanded if necessary. Where we've identified an approach for an off market uh, uh, strategy, we will discuss and agree the process with the seller. A direct approach is made to the selected buyer or a handful of selected buyers who we believe could potentially have a strong desire to acquire the business should they be made aware of it. If they're not already registered with us, we'll request they formally do so and sign a non-disclosure agreement before they receive any information at all. Once the NDA is signed, they initially receive the memorandum of sale followed by the financials pack if they have a further interest. During the discussions with the buyer, they are made aware that they have been given an opportunity to acquire the business before it hits the open market and should therefore make a strong offer if they want to secure it. If for any reason we're unable to come to an agreement, we can quickly revert to the open market approach if required. On average, the period of marketing where viewings are taking place is usually between one and six weeks. Now, each pharmacy sale is different, so this period can sometimes be shorter or longer, depending on the circumstances. Hutchings used a tried and tested structured offer process that has been used over many years. Occasionally, we may recommend to a seller they consider an individual offer, but in most cases, when we feel it's appropriate to set an offer deadline and call in offers, we'll discuss and agree this with our client before setting a date. We use a formal offer template letter to avoid any misunderstandings. This is particularly important with company share sales as they're usually more complicated. As part of the process, we request proof of funding from the buyer and work to secure a deposit as, as well if their offer is accepted. The deposit we look to achieve is usually no less than 20,000 pounds. Most sales usually require one round of offers only. We encourage buyers to submit their best and final offers by a closing date together with supporting evidence for proof of funding, such as bank statements or provisional bank offers to lend. Once an offer is accepted, we then move into the legal stage. I won't go into too much depth about this as both Nick and Artif will cover this area in more detail for you but we arrange for the buyer's deposit to be paid across to your solicitor who holds the monies in their client account. The deposit monies are held in accordance with an exclusivity agreement, which both the buyer and seller are asked to sign. In exchange for paying a deposit, the buyer is granted a period of exclusivity, whereby other potential buyers are excluded from making an offer. We then issue the heads of terms to all parties, including professional advisors, confirming the sale. Our role as an agent then changes from one of marketing to that of sales progression as we consult with all parties during the sale to ensure the transaction is progressing forwards. Once an offer is accepted, an average time scale to reach completion is around three to four months. However, there are many factors that can slow this down, such as COVID-19, bank delays, the NHS change of ownership process, and lease issues to name but a few. As I come towards the end of my presentation, I wanted to briefly highlight some of the key issues for buyers which can adversely affect the sale and even the final purchase price, which you as a seller should avoid if at all possible. This slide shows some of the various issues that can arise, but by no means covers them all. I'll highlight three of the most common issues that we tend to see. We often see accounts which are inaccurate. This can have a detrimental effect on the buyer's confidence to proceed or pay a premium price as well as impact the lender's willingness to lend. A common error in accounts, for example, is when locum costs are inserted in the cost of sales instead of appearing under expenses, as with other staff salaries. This simple error can distort the gross profit and the margin, making the business appear less attractive. This can potentially result in a lower offer from buyers, or in worst case scenario, no offers at all. It's important that your accounts are presented as accurately and easy to understand as possible, 
to avoid creating any uncertainty on the buyer's behalf. Another common issue that can occur is when a seller employs new or additional members of staff after a sale has been agreed. Whilst you must continue to run the business up until completion, it's important that buyers are consulted about staff changes, as extra staff costs could impact their funding or business plans post-completion. Without consulting with the buyer, you could leave yourself open to a possible renegotiation on the sale price. The final issue that can cause a significant problem is where even in the run-up to or during a sale, expensive contracts are renewed. An example could be for new computer or software systems. A new owner may wish to incorporate the pharmacy into an existing system they currently use or may prefer an alternative provider for other reasons. But ideally, where possible, these decisions should be delayed or taken in consultation with the new incoming owner who will be responsible for the ongoing cost post-completion of the sale. When considering selling, it's important to appoint an agent who can provide guidance, support, and is prepared to work hard to achieve the best outcome for you. The team at Hutchins Consultants and our sister company, Hutchins Accountants, strongly believe that we have the necessary expertise, knowledge and skills to manage your sale and achieve the best price the market will pay for your business. At Hutchins, we have a close-knit team who have over 130 years combined knowledge and experience in selling pharmacies. We take pride in the service we provide to our clients and work hard to achieve the best outcome for them. Our experience ensures we can oversee your sale right from the start through to completion. Although we regularly travel around Scotland and the rest of the UK, all of our consultants are based in one central office, which allows us to quickly share intelligence on buyers and activity in the current market. We also collaborate closely with our colleagues at Hutchins Accountants. If an accountancy related issue arises during a sale, we can quickly call upon their specialist accounting expertise for advice. Numerous times their valuable assistance has helped keep a sale on track, which otherwise might have fallen through. We have a large database of potential buyers who have registered from all parts of the UK. They range from eager first time buyers through to the multiples who we have strong contacts with. This allows us to attract potential buyers for a pharmacy quickly. Finally, we have a straightforward no sale, no fee sale agreement. There are no upfront marketing costs at all, and we only receive our commission fee once your sale has completed. So that concludes my presentation for this evening. If you'd like to discuss a potential sale, please do not hesitate to contact either myself or my colleague Ryan Smith, who also oversees our sales in Scotland. We can offer you a free verbal valuation, a free tax review. We can also arrange a confidential meeting with either myself or one of my fellow consultants at your pharmacy. I'll now hand you over to Nicker Anderson Straven, who will explain his important role in the sale of a pharmacy business. Uh, Paul, you will uh, hand over to Nick in just a second. Uh, <laughs> I uh, realised I, I didn't mention at the beginning that about the Q and A. Um, so there is, um, will, will we have um, hosting a Q and A at the end of the um, uh, uh, webinar for all three presentations? Uh, and there is a, a way that you can submit your questions in your um, viewer. If you look down at the bottom, there should be a, a little grey, is it grey or green? A little grey uh, button that says Q and A on it. When you click on that. Um, a little window pops up and you can submit your questions. So they, they come through to, to us four uh, here um, and we'll see those and then we'll answer as many as we can uh, at, at the end of the webinar. And we will answer every question. Um, if not in the webinar, then afterwards we'll follow up with you directly. So, so you know, any questions you've got, you can submit them confidentially and we'll you know, make sure that you either get an answer tonight or, or within the next couple of days. Uh, I just realized I hadn't said that at the beginning. So uh, yeah, stick your questions uh, at, um, uh, below in, in that Q&A box and we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we, uh, we go over to you. Uh, okay, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll hand back to the, uh, to the presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Paul. Uh, and seeing as I'm on uh, screen, Nick, I will hand over to you. Uh, Nick, your um, webcam is still off. Can I get you to turn that on, please?
Uh, that's great. Oh, yes. And we've Hello. got your mic now. Great. So uh, it's bye from me and Paul for now. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Paul. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, hopefully the, you can all hear me and also you can see the presentation slides of mine on screen now. Yes, we, we, we can see you, Nick. OK, that's great. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Nicholas Howey. I am a partner at Anderson Strathairn. I work in the corporate team and I head up the Anderson Strathairn healthcare team within our corporate department. Um, we do a number of work for healthcare clients and, of course, a number of work for pharmacy clients in particular. Um, we've done work in the past with Hutchings and we're delighted to be invited to come and participate and partner with them in this webinar this evening. And hopefully you find this helpful. Um, if I can give you a little bit of background about Anderson and Strathairn to begin with. Anderson Strathairn, we are a leading Scottish law firm. We have offices in Edinburgh, Glasgow, East Lothian, and now also in Shetland. Uh, we act for a number of pharmacy clients, ranging from single pharmacy owners, independent small chains, to one of the largest pharmacy chains in the UK. Our team has significant experience advising on a variety of pharmacy transactions across Scotland. And these are some of the examples of our pharmacy expertise and things that we've advised clients on in the past. So we advised on corporate structuring and reorganizations, funding and refinancing, whether that be from banks or other sources of finance. We've done partnership agreements and shareholders agreements for pharmacy clients. We've been involved in the leasing, the sale and the purchase of pharmacy premises. We've given advice on employment law and all sorts of related employment law matters. We've advised on GDPR and intellectual property rights. And one of my colleagues has also advised on trademark infringement and grey market products in the past. And of course, one of the largest areas of the work that we do within the healthcare team in the pharmacy section is the sale and purchase of assets or shares in pharmacy businesses, which leads us into what we're here to talk about this evening, selling pharmacies. So an overview of my section of the webinar. Um, I've got some additional comments on the market as we have seen it recently, just adding on to what Paul's already discussed. Um, and then I'm going to do a, a sort of canter through overview of the legal process and documentation. I will touch on heads of terms, due diligence and data rooms, sale and purchase agreements, the disclosure letter, property arrangements, employees, and some completion and post-completion matters for you to consider. And then lastly, I'll wrap up with some key takeaways, which are hopefully beneficial to you if you're considering selling your pharmacy in the future. So moving on, so comments um, on the market as we have seen it recently. Um, it is a very active sector. Um, I agree completely with Paul's comment. Um, owners now seem to be getting a bit of breathing space to consider a sale. There was a period where I think everybody was just basically had their, their nose to the grindstone is how one, of, one pharmacy client put it to me. And you know, they didn't have a chance to do anything other than just be working. And they were working all hours covering people who in the pharmacy had COVID and dealing with various COVID related matters. Um, and again, just to reiterate the, the, the comment that Paul made earlier, the central belt is very, very popular still. And um, if you are interested in pharmacies out with the central belt, um, the competition for them doesn't seem to be quite so high but they are still popular. But as I say, the central belt is very hot just now. Um, it is a fundable sector. Um, it's looked on favorably by the banks and it's not only the sort of traditional funders in that sense. We've also, I just recently completed a, a transaction which was funded by Unity Bank. Um, we've also seen, um, as Paul said, it's very difficult for new entrants to enter the market and purchase a pharmacy. Um, Prices are very high, 
uh, and even with banks being supportive um, in getting enough money to sort of put in the sort of deposit element or the own personal element is challenging for some first time buyers. But we have seen a bank of mum and dad um, helping fund that in some instances recently. Um, in terms of deal structures, um, very much um, if it is a company and there are shares involved, it tends to be it is a share sale as opposed to a business and asset sale if the pharmacy is contained within one company or one subsidiary. Um, I don't want to steal Atif's thunder later on when he talks about uh, tax structuring. So um, I will leave that at the moment, but you can basically sell you the shares or you can sell the business and assets. In terms of timescales, um, there are no fixed timescales. Three to four months, yes, that's, that's a realistic timescale. Um, we have done pharmacy sales faster than that, and we have done some that have taken longer than that. And sometimes it's intentional that they take longer than that. It's deliberately plotted that way. And sometimes it is unforeseen circumstances which cause matters to be delayed. And hopefully one of the benefits of this presentation is that um, we will be able to help you minimize any delays to your transaction. So an overview of the legal process and the documentation associated with it. Um, heads of terms, Paul mentioned these earlier. Heads of terms, um, if you're not aware, essentially set out the key terms of the sale. They usually include details of the parties. That will be the details of the seller or sellers, plural, the buyer. And it may be there's also additional warrantors and or guarantors known about and who will be a party to the agreement at that stage. Um, they will set out what is being sold by the sellers and what is being purchased by the buyer. I, I know that sounds like stating the stunningly obvious, but it's not always as straightforward as that, especially if you're doing a business and asset sale and it might be there's more than one pharmacy owned by the buyer. They're only selling one potentially and there are bits that are to be carved out of business. So it's got to be clear what it is that the seller is selling and the purchaser expects to purchase. Heads of terms will also set out the sale price and any price calculation and or price adjustment mechanisms, arrangements in regard to property, and I will touch on that more later, so I'll leave that for just now, the proposed timescales with a view to completion and any other key terms. As I mentioned earlier, you know there, there may be some things like if it's a, a number of pharmacies, um, is there a pharmacy van, for example, which is being sold in the sale or excluded from the sale, um, what members of staff are going to be transferred across. Uh, and when I say that, I'll talk about Tupi later on, but you know, it could be that the sellers could be husband and wife, for example. I have recently purchased a pharmacy where the sellers were a partnership and it was um, mother, father and son. And it's a question of, you know, are they all going to be resigning from that element of the pharmacy or will any of them be staying on for any period post completion? Heads of terms are not usually binding, but the confidentiality provisions can be included within them and also exclusivity provisions, excuse me, as Paul mentioned earlier. Um, and if those were included, they would be legally binding. And sometimes you will see heads of terms referred to as HOTs. And I mention this because I'm conscious having done a number of pharmacy transactions with clients, um, especially clients who are doing these things for the first time are sometimes very unfamiliar with the terminology. And some of the terminology is banded around quite freely. A lot of solicitors are aware of it, but the clients are not. And it's useful for you to understand what the sort of acronyms are and the shorthand terminology that solicitors use. Um, in terms of due diligence and data rooms, the due diligence is essentially the, the buyer wants to know what they are purchasing and that will be the basis of them completing the purchase. Is usually structured around what's known as a due diligence questionnaire. And again, that's normally referred to as a DDQ. That's received from the buyer's solicitor. 
it covers all sorts of matters. It includes references to accounts, references to tax, references to pension, employees, um, scripts, uh, any relationships with doctor surgeries, whether um, prescriptions are collected from there, um, all sorts of things, not all necessarily related just solely to a pharmacy, but related to any business. So it will look for details of all the contracts that you have, um, and that will include things like contracts for fire extinguishers, um, alarms, etc. The due diligence process is often facilitated through what we call an electronic data room. That's normally set up by the seller solicitor and it's online. The seller provides information and the copies of the contracts and the documentation to their solicitor. We upload it onto the data room and that can then be viewed and accessed by the buyer and the buyer solicitor and any other buyer advisor team. And it can also be viewed obviously by the seller side team as well. Due diligence is a time consuming process. There is no getting around that. Um, but I do stress that just now because it is better to spend the time working through it diligently, um, pun intended, at the outset in order that you are able to be best placed to progress your sale as efficiently and quickly as possible. Um, a number of transactions I've come across in the past where they have issues or they don't proceed with timescales as expected is because the sellers do not do the diligence process uh, properly or thoroughly. And all that happens is it leads to a further round of questions from the buyer's solicitor asking for additional information for the diligence process. Generally, that also slows down the process, but frustrates parties because they have to go back and sometimes repeat some of the work that they've done on a more full basis. Um, the diligence process is also useful for the seller because you can use the diligence process and the contents of the data room for disclosure purposes. And I'll talk slightly more about that shortly. So the, the sale and purchase agreement, this is the, the, the main course, if I can put it that way, in terms of the transaction. Um, if you're selling shares, it's normally a share purchase agreement, otherwise known as an SPA. If you're selling business and assets, it's what's known as a business and assets purchase agreement, um, again, abbreviated to BPA, or you'll sometimes see that referred to as an asset purchase agreement, an APA. And this is the legally binding contract in respect of the sale. So this is normally um, covering all matters in connection with the sale. It covers all the key sale terms in respect of payment, timescales, parties. Um, but it will also include what we call restrictive covenants. And these are essentially the restrictions upon you, the seller, after the sale has completed. Um, normally, it is things to the effect of for a period of 12 months or 24 months post transaction, you will not compete with the business um, in terms of um, trying to poach staff, um, setting up another pharmacy, for example, down the road. I appreciate with pharmacies, that's not actually as practical as um, it might be in other transactions. But it's to protect the buyer having bought the business that you're not then going to come back and compete against them. Um, I, I've done a transaction recently where we had restrictive covenants inserted to do with um, Glasgow postcodes in terms of, you know, the, the, the buyer agreed that they would not uh, compete within certain Glasgow postcodes, but also the seller said that they would not go and compete within uh, postcodes which relate to the buyer's remaining pharmacy that they're still retained. Um, you also have warranties. Warranties are the warranties that the sellers give to the buyer on the sale of their business. Um, the warranties can go on for about 20, 30, 40 pages. They cover all sorts of matters. They cover whether the sellers own the business, they cover the accounts and the information supplied. They cover references to management accounts, references to employees, um, reference to uh, pharmacy script numbers, for example, 
um, if you know of any other pharmacies to open up in the area nearby, or if you know of any GP practices or nursing homes that are due to move or have indicated that they're going to move. But a warranty, in, in very simple terms, a warranty is a statement that the seller warrants to say this statement is 100% true. And if it is not 100% true, then the buyer is entitled to make what is called a warranty claim and come after the seller potentially um, for a financial amount of money. What we do is we try and minimize the number of warranties for you. And you can say you can revise them or delete them, or you can disclose against them via the disclosure letter. And so if you delete the warranty, obviously it doesn't exist and you're not making the reference anymore. And um, if you amend it, you can amend it. So you say, for example, if I, I use a silly example and say the warranty says that you know, we have 10 trucks in our yard and all 10 trucks are in working order, you could revise the warranty to say there are only eight trucks in the yard and they are in working order commensurate with age, for example. But you could then also disclose that one of said eight trucks is actually in the garage and you haven't heard whether it is in working order or not. Again, a very simplistic example, but one that I hope is easy for you to understand. Um, warranties are capped normally for a period of 12 or 24 months. So um, you're only making these statements for a period of time and the, warrant, the, the buyer has an opportunity to make a claim within set time periods. As I say, normally for non-tax warranties, it's 12 to 24 months after the completion of the sale. Um, in connection with tax warranties, it normally waits to a period of seven years after the sale. Um, it, sometimes you also have indemnities. Indemnities are normally in connection with a very specific matter where the buyer has identified through the diligence process a concern and they want to be protected in connection with that concern. We always try and advise clients not to give any indemnities. Sometimes you need to, and sometimes they are a way of facilitating the transaction. But an indemnity is similar to a warranty, although it relates to a very specific matter, and it is normally regarded as a bit of a blank check in terms of the buyer. So if, if something happens or there is an issue in connection with that indemnity, you are saying you will make the buyer not be out of pocket in connection with that matter. Um, in connection with share sales, there is also a tax covenant. This is because the buyer will be acquiring the whole of the company and it will be warts and all with all of the company's pre-existing tax history. And if there's any tax liabilities, the buyer does not want to be responsible for any tax that should have been paid by you as a seller and the tax covenant normally provides them with cover in regard to that. So if there's tax outstanding, then they are entitled to come and basically ring your doorbell and say, we have received a notice from the HMRC, there's a certain amount of tax outstanding, and the tax covenant is essentially the legal way of providing them with a remedy against the seller if that exists. Then the disclosure letter, uh, I mentioned this earlier on, it's normally prepared by the seller and it identifies any of the exceptions or caveats, the warranties which are given by the seller. Um, as I said, um, well, um, normally it's divided into two parts, I should say. There's normally general disclosures and specific disclosures and it will have copies of the documents which are disclosed. That's normally referred to as a disclosure bundle. And the disclosure bundle nowadays normally consists of the contents of the virtual data room that I mentioned earlier. So the, all of the due diligence documentation, the contracts, et cetera, that were all uploaded for the buyer and their team to pour through are then deemed to be disclosed and they will provide you with protection against any warranty claims. Um, yet yeah, the golden rule for a seller when preparing a disclosure letter is you always disclose everything that you think is relevant. And when I speak to clients, I say to them, you disclose absolutely everything. And um, don't sit and think, oh, I wonder if 
Um, maybe they don't need to know that. If there's anything that you are not sure of or you think that they should tell the buyer, tell your solicitor, make sure it's disclosed. Even if you think that the buyer is aware of that particular matter, uh, or you think that the buyer is aware of that particular matter, you need to do this to protect yourself. Um, and yes, and finally that bullet point at the end, if you've got any doubts as to whether something should be included within a disclosure, the prudent approach is to include it in the disclosure letter to protect yourself. It's better to over disclose than to under disclose. Moving to talk about property arrangements. Um, and again, this is important. I stress I'm not a property lawyer. We have a, a property team within Anderson and Strathairn. We work closely with them. And there are members of that that are within our healthcare team, if I can explain it as that. Um, but in terms of property, it's important that you understand what's happening with the pharmacy property. Um, is it a sale of the property? Is the property actually included within the company? So it's included within the share sale. If it's not a share sale and it's a business and asset sale, is the property being sold by the sellers? Sometimes it's not. Sometimes um, the property is not being sold, it is being leased. So it might be that the sellers actually own the property just now, but they want to keep it. Um, I've seen a number of occasions where if the seller is essentially retiring from pharmacy, they retain ownership of the property and it provides some retirement income because they have a lease of the property to the buyer going forward. Now, in some circumstances, the sellers do not own the property at all. They lease the property themselves from a third party. Um, and in that case, you need to get an assignation of the lease. Um, one of the points to stress here is assignations of lease involve third party landlords, obviously, but that also involves another set of solicitors. And history tells us that generally third party landlords are not particularly motivated to do anything quickly. It's not a high priority on their list. And it's also by default, not normally a high priority on their solicitors list. And they will not push that forward. So they really need to be prodded, poked, cajoled in order to get that done for you. And that can have an implication on timescales. Paul mentioned earlier, if the buyer is being bank funded, they may require a minimum term lease period for funding purposes. Uh, in Scotland, there is a minimum term lease period in order for a property to be registered with the Land Register of Scotland. Um, if, it is if it is above that term period, then it can be registered and the um, lease can then be used for security purposes. But traditionally, certainly the banks normally are looking for a period of 10 to 15 years on a lease um, that they're funding in connection with a pharmacy purchase. Employees, to pay or not to pay? And a smiley face, yes, apologies. It's, it's a terrible joke, but I couldn't resist. Um, to pay is a transfer of undertakings Protection of Employment Regulations 2006. Um, I, I mention this only here because it is something that a number of sellers in the past have been unsure of and not clear on. Um, I think the easiest way to explain it is if, if TUPE does apply, its effect is it's an automatic transfer of the employees to the buyer and the buyer essentially steps into the shoes of the seller with regard to the employees, their terms of employment and their employment contracts. If it is a business and asset sale, generally TUPE will apply. If it is a share sale, then TUPE does not apply because essentially the buyer is buying the company and the employees' contracts of employment are with the company, so they don't actually change and their employer does not change either. Completion and post-completion matters. Um, just a few things I think it's useful for clients to know uh, and experience tells me people are not always aware of. Um, it's important for you to be aware of the funds flow. 
Um, this applies whether you are a buyer or a seller. And um, normally the funds flow is funding comes from the lender or the lender solicitors to the buyer solicitors and the funds are then transferred to sellers solicitors. All of that takes time. Um, we are in the days of electronic bank transfers, but even at that, you will hear reference to bank cutoff times, etc. when you are dealing with solicitors around completion time scales. And sometimes we have situations where, depending on transaction times and when documentation is signed, there's not enough time for the funds to be transferred that day and it rolls on into the next day. We have generally ways of dealing with that within the legal profession but you just need to understand that is how it works. And it's useful for clients to know. Um, with regards to completion arrangements, um, we don't always have to do things by physical signing nowadays. We are able to do virtual signing. And even if we're doing physical signing, we can do what we call counterpart execution. So that means that not everybody has to all be in the same room signing documentation at the same time. Electronic signing is really now um, moving forward and being adopted much more in terms of transactions. The one thing that I need to say is within Scotland, we at the moment cannot do electronic signing in connection with property documentation. So you just need to be aware if there's property documentation involved, that probably will involve an element of physical signing. So that means you need to make yourself available to go to a solicitor's office and that might mean having locum cover etc so there's all these things to think about with regard to completion there is normally also a stock take and again that needs to be arranged in advance um are you going to be present at the stock take do you have a representative present at the stock take um I, I've had a number of um, amusing stock take stories in the past but um, I will save them for another day Suffice to say that um, one client at one point had an issue where they felt they were getting a, a large number of show sandals, um, mainly because the seller was basically taking all show sandals that they couldn't sell from a number of their pharmacies and then trying to drop them all off into the one pharmacy that they were selling so that they got rid of them that way. Um, with regard to contractor codes, um, Normally, we are not involved in contractor codes and changes over to contractor codes. But again, this is something that you need to be aware of. Um, I understand the process of comparatively smooth. I've assisted a number of clients with it in the past, but most clients are normally quite experienced and capable of doing it by themselves. And they've had good conversations with the health board. Apportionments need to be worked out in terms of employment costs, you know, staff salaries, etc. Again, normally not too much of an issue but you need to be aware of it. And if there's completion accounts to be prepared, they need to be prepared and agreed within the timescale set out in the share purchase agreement. Um, I, I stress this because it, it would not be the first time that I've experienced that buyers or sellers accountants have had issues in terms of getting these prepared within the timescales or at the very last minute saying that they, dis, they disagreed with them but it was almost too tight to notify the other party within the timescales to avoid the completion accounts being deemed to be agreed. Atif may wish to explain more about that. And then finally, some, some key takeaways. Engage professional advisors early. It is, it's always better to try and get your advisors on board early. They can help point out pitfalls. They can avoid you getting sucked into a trap of agreeing to something with a buyer that later on you are not able to comply with or puts you in a detrimental position. If you're unsure of any terminology, please ask your solicitor. We're here to help you and to guide you through the process. It's important you understand what you're being asked to do, what documentation is and how it affects you. Um, start collating paperwork, contract documentation, furlough information, for example, um, all as early as possible. These are all things that take time for you to dig out. Um, it's easier to start digging them out early or to try to ask people where they are rather than having to run around at the last minute trying to find them or potentially having to go to a pharmacy and getting them out of hours because you don't want staff to be alerted that you're taking copies of all the documentation, et cetera, away. 
if you don't have some contracts or you can't find some of the information, if you start at the outset, getting them gathered together early, you can probably ask suppliers, et cetera, to send you copies of them. If there's staff contracts that haven't been signed or pages are missing, et cetera, you can deal with some of these things early. Um, also, if you have any outstanding debt, especially any that's secured, it's best to address that as early as possible because that may be held by a bank or an unrelated third party. And again, that normally involves bank solicitors or the third party solicitors. And you have to agree how that is going to be repaid. Is there any penalties? What documentation needs to be obtained in order to get completion done and exhibit the documentation for discharges at completion? Um, I do appreciate that as a, a very quick, as I say, canter through legal process. I hope it has been helpful to you. Um, and obviously there is a Q&A session at the end. And I'm happy to take any questions then. And on that basis, I will stop uh, and advice hand over to Atif just now. Thanks very much for your time and attention. Thanks, Nick, and hi, everyone. My name's Artif Bhatt, and I'm the Senior Accountant at Hutchings Accountants, where we've been specialising in pharmacy sales across the UK for over 30 years. Today, we're talking about how to maximise the sale price of your pharmacy in Scotland. And we'll be looking at some of the things you need to consider along the way to get the most out of the process. We've heard some excellent points from Paul and Nick on coming to market and the legal aspects of the sale. And now I'll be focusing on accounting and tax matters so you can get a comprehensive idea of what you need to be thinking about and when. We'll be covering preparing for sale, pre-sale issues, due diligence, the legal process, completion, the completion accounts, and what happens after completion. Let's start by talking about the first step, preparing for sale and understanding your tax position. If you are thinking of selling your business in the future, it's never too early to start getting ready, even if you don't plan to sell for many years. Being properly prepared can make a huge difference in not only the price you eventually get, but also with how much you're left with after paying the tax man to enjoy in your retirement. This has never been as important as it is now, with a number of risks and uncertainties facing the pharmacy sector and beyond. Recent events such as the COVID pandemic, Brexit and the current war in Ukraine have changed our lives in a way that would have been unimaginable a few years ago and contributed to rising costs in a number of areas. Inflation and interest rates are predicted to increase for some time and the economy is facing an unprecedented challenge and also we're likely to see changes in tax rates and reliefs coming in the near future as we have seen recently. With a new cabinet having just come in and measures introduced to keep the economy afloat costing hundreds of billions of pounds, the government still needs to find ways of increasing its revenue. The previous Chancellor commissioned a review on capital gains tax, which remains an obvious target for change as it's currently charged at lower rates than income tax. Unlike income taxes, capital gains tax in Scotland is charged at UK rates and thresholds. The government made significant changes to entrepreneurs' relief two years ago, which I'll talk about later, and it's very possible that we may see further changes to come. Sector and market conditions. Paul's talked about the current state of the market and how it's been affected by recent events. But as we've seen, there are a number of factors that can change things significantly over the coming years. Of course, it's impossible for us to predict what's going to happen now and in the future, but the best way to manage these risks is to be prepared. Once you've decided you want to sell your pharmacy, be sure to get specialist advice that takes your individual circumstances into account. This will help you work out the best strategy for the eventual sale, having considered the accounting, legal and marketing perspectives. At Hutchings Accountants, we start by reviewing your accounts and tax position to recommend the most effect uh, tax efficient way to structure your sale and extract the profits. Getting this right can have huge implications that could make a difference of hundreds of thousands of pounds on your tax bill. So it's really important to look at this as early as possible as getting the best, best tax treatment 
sometimes involves making changes to the business years in advance of an eventual sale. If your pharmacy is trading through a limited company, the sale can be structured as a share sale or an asset sale, as Nick explained earlier. To decide on the right structure for a company sale from a tax point of view, we calculate what your estimated tax bill would be from each option, as there is a considerable difference in the tax treatment. A share sale means you will be taxed personally on the gain and pay capital gains tax. An asset sale would mean the company selling the business and paying corporation tax, and potentially you're subject to a further personal tax charge when you want to take out the profits. If you are considering a company share sale or personal asset sale, you may qualify for Business Asset Disposal Relief, or BADR, formerly known as Entrepreneur's Relief. BADR is a relief that can apply when someone sells part or all of their business and means you only need to pay tax at a rate of 10% on the gain as long as certain conditions are met. Each individual has a lifetime limit of £1 million worth of gains which can qualify, which was reduced from the previous lifetime limit of £10 million. In a share sale, the qualifying conditions are that you need to hold at least 5% of the shares and voting rights and be either an employee or an officer of the company, which must be a trading company. These conditions have to be met for at least 24 months before the disposal. So without business asset disposal relief, if you were to sell your business for a million pounds, you'd be liable to capital gains tax at 20%, which is 200,000 pounds. But if you qualified for the relief, this would be reduced to 10%, meaning you'd only need to pay £100,000, a huge tax saving. Now, there are circumstances where you may not qualify for the relief. For example, when you're trading through a limited company which also owns investment assets such as shares or property, or which has a high level of cash at the point of sale. It's crucial to identify any problems as early as possible so you can take the necessary steps to remedy them. If you are considering selling your pharmacy in the next few years, we recommend you take advantage of our roadmap to sales service, which is aimed at pharmacy owners who'd like to increase the business's value before they sell. Using an initial valuation prepared by Hutchings Consultants, we identify the key performance indicators affecting value and look at how these could be improved. We also look at any issues picked up in our review of the accounts and tax position and work out the steps necessary to resolve them to ensure you get the most favourable tax treatment when the time comes. Finally, we map out a list of prioritised targets we want the business to achieve and when we want to achieve them. This can be things like reducing stock holding, increasing uh, your gross profit margin, or reducing staff cost, or making sure the sale will qualify for the business asset disposal relief. As part of our service, we use customized management reports to analyze and monitor the business's performance each quarter and ensure you're on track to meet your targets for improvement. During this time, we also use the reports to compare your pharmacies to similar ones in a process called benchmarking. These reports help us to look at how the potential market value of the business is changing as time progresses based on the most recent performance, so we can check we're moving in the right direction. Twice a year, we review the results and re-evaluate our plan where necessary. That way, we could also factor in any changes in circumstance and revise our targets and timeline accordingly. The aim of this process is to increase the value of the pharmacy as much as possible before it goes to market. It's important to remember that every £100 spent on getting the right professional advice and input can increase the profitability of your business by thousands of pounds, which in turn can increase the value of your pharmacy by tens of thousands when it's time to sell. Now, as we've said, preparation is key, and it's worth looking in a bit more detail at some of the things that we commonly see in pharmacy share sales that can cause problems or present opportunities. I talked earlier about the conditions for business asset disposal relief. If you have a company with more than one class of share, this may need to be looked at as some of the shares may not qualify for the relief at present. Your company also won't qualify if it owns too many investments or holds too much cash, 
as HMRC would no longer consider it to be just a trading company. The level of cash in any director's loans can have other implications on the sale, which may need to be considered so that it can be dealt with in the, in the transaction. Investment property owned by a company can cause problems with BADR, but we also commonly see pharmacy companies that own the trading pr premises they operate from, which is a different uh, case. Sometimes these are included in the business sale, but there are cases where the business owners want to take them out of the company before the sale so they can provide the new owners with a lease and benefit from the rental income. It's important to take professional advice on the most tax efficient way to do this. Another area that's worth considering early on is what you want to take from the business in the form of salary, pensions and dividends in the years leading up to your sale. Tax rates on salaries and dividends are generally much higher than the 10% rate you can achieve on a sale with BADR. So generally speaking, it makes sense to take less salary and dividends from the business if these are going to be taxed at a higher rate. This will mean the company's cash balance may be higher at the point of sale and care needs to be taken that it's not so much higher that HMRC no longer consider the company a trading company and our business asset disposal relief is lost. However, it's also important to remember that some dividend income is taxed at 8.75%, uh, which is going to be reduced to 7.5% next April. Um, and even before this decrease can represent the tax saving over the rate you get on sale. So it's well worth engaging in some tax planning in your final years of ownership to make sure that you optimise your takings so that you're paying the lowest rate of tax overall on your lifetime earnings. These are some of the things to consider before a sale, but now let's talk briefly about what happens once you've found a buyer. Nick set out the main aspects of the legal process earlier. And once your potential buyer pays their deposit, the next steps are the due diligence process and finalizing the sale agreement. As accountants, our job is to work alongside your team to make sure this all runs as smoothly as possible. The due diligence process gets underway and the buyer's accountants request a list of information. In a share sale, the buyers will want to go back over several years so they can be as comfortable as possible with the history of the company. Your lawyers will go through the sale agreement with the buyer's lawyers to agree a finalised version. And we will also review this from a tax and accounting perspective, suggest any changes to the main terms and covenants and carefully go through the warranties to make sure the buyers are made aware of any exceptional events or circumstances. You can see how important it is to engage accountants and solicitors who specialise in pharmacy for sales to get this bit right. Because pharmacy is all we deal with and we see so many sale agreements in the course of our work, we know what is appropriate and what is excessive to warrant. And so with our combined experience, we're able to limit your risk. In a share sale, the total amount you receive for selling your shares is made up of the agreed price for the goodwill and fixed assets of the business and an adjustment for the net asset position of the business at the point of sale. The net asset position is made up of the company's current assets. So that's things like the cash it's got in the bank, stock, uh, NHS and VAT debtors, minus the liabilities or things it owes out. Uh, like money owed to suppliers or HMRC. If there are more assets than liabilities, an additional payment is made for the net asset value. But if the liabilities are more than the assets, a deduction is made from the goodwill payment. When the buyers are happy with the results of the due diligence exercise and the sale agreement is close to being agreed by both parties, a target completion date is agreed for ownership of the pharmacy to transfer to the new owners. It's generally helpful if this can be at the end of the month as it makes it much easier to calculate the position at the point where the business is transferred. Once the target date for completion has been agreed, we need to provide the buyer's side with an estimate for the company's net asset position at that date. Of course, we can't provide exact figures at this point, so we estimate this as best we can. This estimate then gives the buyer an idea of the net current asset payment they will need to make in addition to the payment for the goodwill and fixed assets. Once completion accounts have been prepared and agreed by both parties several months down the line, 
a final balancing payment can be made for the action amount due as per the accounts. When we review sale agreements, there are a number of things we look at carefully. For example, the proposed method to calculate the net current asset figure, as this will affect your final payment. The agreement also sets out the terms by which the business must produce the completion accounts and what the procedure would be if the accounts were not agreed by the buyer. We also go through the tax warranties in the agreement very carefully and cross-check them with the company's accounts for the last few years to produce a list of any facts or circumstances that need to be disclosed to the buyer. And these are then collated by your solicitors in the disclosure letter. The tax warranties tend to be very, very detailed and refer to numerous statutes from tax and company law. So it's essential they're looked at by an experienced accountant familiar with your business and pharmacy sales. Putting the time in to get this right means you can sign the sale agreement with peace of mind and confidence that your interests are protected. After completion, the next thing we need to consider is the completion accounts. These need to be prepared with extra care and attention to detail to make sure they're in line with the sale agreement and also represent the closing position of the company as accurately as possible. So you can benefit from all the profits from your period of ownership of the business without paying for any of the business expenses from after this date. Once the accounts have been prepared on this basis, they're sent to the buyer's accountants to review. And under the terms of the sale agreement, they have a specified period in which to inform us of any disputes or to accept the accounts. After reviewing the accounts, the buyer's accountants will either accept them or send a list of any items they believe should be included or removed from the accounts. For example, payments made by the company after completion that they believe were incurred before completion. We would go through these uh, points of dispute and try to agree them with the buyers and revise the accounts accordingly so that they're accepted by both parties. The buyer will then release the final balancing payment for the net current assets, which means you've now received full payment for your business. The final step is declaring the sale on your personal tax return and calculating and paying the tax due. The sale will fall in a tax year ended 5th of April and would need to be reported in your tax return for that tax year. This would need to be submitted and the tax paid by the 31st of January the following year. As an example, if you sold your business on the 1st of January 2022, this would fall into the 2021-2022 tax year and your tax return and payment would be due to HMRC by the 31st of January 2023. If you were to receive a total of £1 million for your business and its assets and pay professional fees of £50,000, your total gains from the sale would be £950,000 and the capital gains tax due on this after the application of your annual allowance and business asset disposal relief would be just under £94,000. Once we've calculated your tax bill, we can also advise you on ways to reduce it. If you haven't already, you should also take advice on estate planning and your will. It's also worth considering your exposure to inheritance tax. When you own your business, you benefit from business relief, which means if you were to die, the business assets would be outside of the scope of inheritance tax. But once the business is sold, business relief no longer applies and your share of the cash proceeds would be liable to inheritance tax if you were to pass away unexpectedly. We also in advise all our clients to talk to an independent financial advisor who can guide you on investments you can make for a tax efficient income in retirement. And finally, you just need to think about what to spend the rest of your money on. Thanks very much, everyone. I will hand over back now to Sam. What to spend the rest of my money on? <laughs> uh, can you can you help me with that, Artif? Is that part of it's your skill set? It, it's a nice problem to have, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that. Um, thank you, uh, uh, all three of you. Um, I didn't realise that there was a competition for uh, best and most ridiculous pun, uh, but Nick, <laughs> Nick, you win that. Uh, to pay or not to pay. <laughs> Hands uh, down. Well done. Hands down. Brilliant. Um, Thank you. Okay, so uh, we've got um, 
uh, about 10 minutes for for a QA. and uh, we've had a few come in so if it's okay with you guys i'm just going to run straight into them yeah um, brill um paul off off um off air you and i were just um going over a couple that have come in and uh, i know that you want to make sure you go over at least uh one of those so do you want to do you want to start then paul yeah, absolutely. No, that's fine. Thank you, uh, uh, Nick, Artif, and uh, Sam. So, um, yeah, a couple of questions that are coming um, towards the uh, consultants, Hutchins consultants. Um, one of those is, uh, do buyers prefer to take a lease or buy the heritable property if available? Um, certainly, I think uh, the vast majority of buyers, if they've got the financial ability to do so, um, would prefer to uh, buy the heritable property. Um, it depends on quite often on the size of the business. So, for example, um, I, I, I've had um, a, a occasions or sales where perhaps the uh, the business um, uh, has predominantly been aimed at first time buyers. Perhaps you know I, I can think of one where it's around four hundred thousand pounds turnover, um, but it occupied a, a premises uh, quite an affluent sort of premises, which was uh, probably worth somewhere around a million pounds. So. Um, it can be difficult in that sort of set of circumstances for a first time buyer looking to acquire a business where they're, they're, they're stretching themselves to uh, to afford the business to then sort of take on um, a property um, to, to, you know, that sort of value. It's just find an extra million. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, uh, um, but yeah, wherever possible buyers do, do, do wish to, uh, to, to take that on um, and uh, banks, uh, quite often offer sort of favorable terms, loan to value uh, terms for, for those buyers. Uh, I don't believe all, but some some do. So it can be quite an attractive proposition for uh, uh, for a buyer to uh, to, to buy the the, um, uh, the property if they can. Mm. Cool. Okay. Uh, nice. Thanks, Paul. Um, I know you've got one more, but Nick, uh, I'm going to come to you next. Yeah. Can I can I also just, just add on a little, a little bit to Paul's sure, answer? Sure, there? sure. Um, so we, we have seen before, so yes, generally buyers do, I would agree, want to try and own the property. Sometimes they can't afford to buy it. Mm. But what we've seen on, on a few transactions recently is if the seller owns the property, then when they, they have been granting a lease, we have also built into that a, an option of first refusal mm. for the, the buyer. So if the seller decides to sell the property at some point, in the future then the buyer gets first first opportunity to buy at market value and that would just be determined by a valuation at the time and um, so that's that's one way of doing it and it also gives the opportunity for the buyer to perhaps kind of build up some of the reserves in order to be able to afford to, to purchase the property so that that's just a, a little bit to add on to the back of that sure um, great yeah okay that's that's useful thank you it, it, um, it, so it, then it, i know there was a question though uh, that, that came in for you nick Sorry, yeah, just, just in terms of the question, um, did, does it make a difference if the, the transaction is funded by a bank or uh, the bank of mum and dad? And in that regard... <laughs> I heard you mentioned that earlier. So, okay, yeah, that, this is interesting. Good, so, okay. Um, there's very few transactions that do not have an element of bank funding on them, in my experience. Um, bank funding um, is normally fine. Banks normally have a healthcare team and they will normally have a healthcare relationship manager that the buyer will have. So that will help guide them through. But I suppose the one thing that I would highlight is that normally means also there's a bank solicitor appointed. Mm -hmm. So the bank solicitor will review all of the legal documentation, including the property documentation as well. So essentially, not only is the seller agreeing it with the buyer and the buyer's solicitor, they're also agreeing it with the buyer's bank and the buyer's bank's solicitor. That adds an element of additional time in terms of time scales, but it, it also adds an element of even if the buyer and seller get on fabulously and there are certain warranties and things that the buyer might say, you know, oh, don't worry, that's fine, just ignore it, delete it. Um, the bank solicitor may put their foot down and say, no, these are standard things that we expect to see oh, yeah. and we expect to see them in uh, a share purchase or an asset purchase agreement. Um, and just finally on that, with regard to Bank of Mum and Dad, um, no, I mean, we, we, we've seen Bank of Mum and Dad doesn't really make a difference from a seller perspective. Um, it, from a buyer perspective, and more importantly, from the buyer's solicitors having experienced this comparatively recently perspective, um, 
with the Law Society of Scotland, we have certain compliance procedures that we need to go through in terms of source of funds, et cetera. So from uh, the solicitor's perspective, it's better to know in advance uh, what's going to happen, how much money is going to come, and is it coming from a mum and dad's joint account? Is it coming from mum's account, some from dad's account, or some from parents' business accounts? Because that all adds to time scales in terms of making sure it's all checked and that we can comply with law society regulations. So it's not just simply a question of how quickly can mum and dad transfer it to the solicitor's bank accounts. Mm. Um, and, I mean, that ties in with what you were saying earlier, Nick, that um, uh, I don't think I think it was the due diligence maybe you were talking about, but it was it was uh, the, the punchline was was if in doubt, you know, like include it. It's something, you know, uh, be um, uh, venture more rather than less are on the side of, of inclusion because it's only going to uh, yeah, help you uh, uh, you know down the line. And I think that, that that applies to everything throughout the entire process and whether that's having a conversation with, you know, Atif and his team or, mm -hmm. or, or, or Paul and, and Ryan, for example, you know, it's better to, you know, to t tell us everything up front, you know, kind of even, even if you think there may be a skeleton in the cupboard, it is better to disclose the skeleton in the cupboard early on where we can help advise and, and deal with that as best as we possibly can whether that's to do with funding, whether that's to do with disclosures, um, whether it's to do with a tax issue or anything. I mean, we, we, we can normally find a way to, to get through it with you, but the more time we have to plan it and to manage it, then the easier and the less cost it incurs from a seller perspective, and we can make it more palatable to a buyer. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. And I think that um, having something... That, that likely through a sale of, of, of this nature, things pretty much everything is going to be combed through. Uh, so yeah, what, whatever it is, everything's going to come out at some point. So speaking to your trusted team, I mean, having if I was selling a pharmacy and I had you three uh, respectively working for me, yeah, like uh, looking at how um, you can approach that uh, and, and get ahead of it. So uh, you know, you can if you need to. Uh, present it in a certain way to either a buyer or the bank or, or whatever it is you know it's it's you three depending on what the issue is that they'll be able to you know present that help you present it as a pharmacy owner in you know really in the in, in the best and most attractive way possible absolutely yeah brilliant nick thank you so look we've got a couple of minutes left um i know um art if you've got one and paul ones and other ones coming for you um so do you want to battle it out between yourselves? Uh, Artif, uh, well, let's, let's, uh, uh, haven't, have, we haven't had a question from you yet. So let's, um, uh, yeah, absolutely. We've, 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 um, we've had a question come in about, well, you know, how much is too much cash in the business for a share sale, um, where, where we've got someone who wants to get the business asset disposal relieved. Um, mm -hmm. It, it is, believe it or not, quite a common question we do get asked. Uh, and unfortunately, it's one that we can't give um, a, a great answer to because it, it is something of a, a grey area. And it's very much going to depend on your, your individual circumstances. So, you know, what we would say is, you know, what, while HMRC provide guidance, what you are going to need is, is professional advice based on your individual circumstances. So it, it's definitely worth talking to your advisor about it as early as possible. Uh, and by your advisor, could that be you? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, it, it, it's something to discuss with, with your accountant. And, um, you know, it's important that that accountant is a pharmacy specialist who's also got experience sure. in the sales market to understand the, the, the issues involved. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Artif. Um, we have hit nine o'clock. Paul, is your question um, a quick one? um yeah i, I think really uh, yes you try yeah, if I yeah just, go on go on go on uh, we'll, we'll just leave for two minutes and then we'll and then we'll close down but yeah, yeah. It'd, be, it'd be great to get it answered yeah i mean it, basically i think it's, it's a good question but it sort of kind of ties in with um uh artists and sort of presentations so i'm not quite ready to sell yet but i'm looking to retire in a couple of years when should i contact you um i i, I think as um uh, my colleagues have mentioned you know as as early as possible really um you know we can start to sort of look at the current value of the business look for um is there any uh, points um, uh, that are highlighted that need to be uh, worked upon, whether it be within the business or it could be within the 
uh, you know, if it's a lease, for example, uh, making sure that everything is as smooth as possible going into a sale. Um, and the longer uh, run up to a sale you can give yourself, uh, eventually the smoother that sale should be and the less stressful <laughs> in, 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 in the long mm. run. So, uh, um, so yeah, by all means, um, do it the next couple of years. Please do get in contact with us. We can start to have those conversations. Okay, well, uh, what a perfect place to uh, wrap up there, Paul. Brilliant. Um, so uh, thank you from Hutchings Consultants, uh, Hutchings Accountants and Anderson Strathern. Uh, we um, will be uh, sending out a uh, recording of this webinar as soon as I download it and get it onto the uh, website. It usually takes me about a day or so to edit it and get, and get it up onto our uh, channel. So you can expect that uh, uh, by the end of this week. Um, and if there's any questions that we haven't managed to answer, uh, whoever's the most uh, relevant from, from our team will we'll follow up with you uh, directly. Thank you most of all to uh, all of our attendees today, uh, and especially to those who are still with us right to the very end. Uh, <laughs> it's been a really, really um, interesting and insightful event. So look, thank you again, and good night. Good night. Good thank night, you. everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. Good night.